afternoon. Um, hi. Um, uh, I'm a visual artist, Asel Kadirhanova, and um, uh, I'm also a PhD researcher at the Uni University of Leeds. And today, um, with Inga Lasse, uh, curator, we will uh, speak about um, diaspora. And uh, yeah, diaspora is an interesting phenomenon. Uh, the word diaspora comes from the Greek word diaspero, which means to disperse or to scatter across. And basically it means a community of people who, were, who has dispersed or um, were displaced from their place of origin, of most often uh, because of traumatic event. And um, to be considered a uh, diaspora, uh, there shouldn't be just a, uh, just a mere physical dispersion. Uh, as um, to be considered a diaspora, um, people have to have or maintain a specific form of memory of their place of um, origin, the place that becomes um, a point of their cultural identity. And in my research, I look at the questions of memory and trauma in post-Soviet societies. In particular, I look at how um, uh, traces of historical trauma persist in time and how we might inherit the past that we did not live through. This is why, among other things, I became interested in diaspora. And I'm interested to research how memory and cultural identity persist throughout generations and um, with people's relocations, or in other words, in space and time. And it's important to remember that it's not just people who move around. Um, dispersions also means dispersions of uh, cultural values, languages, um, um, personal memories and personal traumas. And, uh, this is my work called A Brick to the Vault that I made a couple of years ago for an artist resident in Kazakhstan. In this is installation, I work with three alphabets of, of the Kazakh language. And I use the alphabets to address the issue of cultural identity. In the 20th century, under the Soviet rule, um, Kazakh alphabet was changed twice. First, the traditional Arabic alphabet was replaced by uh, the Latin alphabet, and then in the late 30s, it was replaced by Cyrillic. And at the moment, we use Cyrillic letters. And what is interesting, uh, it might sound abstract, but what, what's interesting, it was also the, the time of the wave of migration from Kazakhstan. People were trying to escape, uh, to escape starvation and political oppression. And later, these people formed a Kazakh diaspora abroad. And uh, what I find fascinating that uh, Kazakh diaspora in uh, different countries use different alphabets. For example, um, people in China, Afghanistan, and Iran use uh, Arabic letters, and people in Turkey, Germany, uh, England, or USA uh, use um, Latin letters. So they cannot kind of communicate with each other in written language, um, although they speak, we speak the same language. And in this work, I use three, um, three alphabets, uh, which I put on the cubes that appropriate the design of educational cubes for children. And on each side of the cube, there is a letter, the same letter, but in, in, three, uh, in a different alphabet. By walking past this installation, the viewer changes the angle, and each time they, they read it in a different alphabet, but they never get um, uh, the full view. It's always a fragmented view. Um, so uh, with this fragmented view, you cannot really grasp the entire phrase. And I would like to refer to the fragmentation of collective memory with many gaps and silences. So yeah, in this, with this installation, I would like to raise a question how everyone is a brick to the vault. Um, and it's, it's on, on the other hand, it's a solid brick of identity, but um, on the other hand, it is um, kind of a brick that can be moved and make new, new towers of meaning. Thank you, Aso. Uh, yeah, so can we have the other image? Yes. Uh, so um, I will continue to speak about diaspora a little bit through the lens of the project called Portable Landscapes that I did with my colleagues and that is still ongoing actually. And uh, you can see an image here uh, from the project when it was exhibited in Riga at the Latvian National Art Museum. And so in a way, the idea of the project was um, uh, to work with uh, Latvian artists in exile, mostly the post-Second World War ones, 
and contemporary artists. And uh, so uh, we did this research because like uh, really after the Second World War, there was massive waves of uh, Latvian um, uh, people uh, that ended up uh, in many different places in the world. And so since there was a Soviet Union, there was no place to kind of come back. So this diaspora and exile scene, they really kind of existed parallelly, right? And uh, and we were thinking, like, how do we kind of reintroduce it to the local scene in Latvia, but also how do we speak about that in New York, in Berlin, in Paris, like in the places where they actually live and what does that mean? And uh, so the project started. And one thing that I would like to raise with this presentation is sort of the curatorial and institutional responsibility that we have. Uh, especially we felt that we have it in relation to uh, European uh, refugee crisis. So there was this moment of crisis and it went on and we thought, so what can we do as an institution? And for us, it seemed that we need to talk about the exile or, or migration of the past, because in Latvia, the attitudes were very like sort of racist. And, and when the European Union division happened in 2015, that, oh, we need to take like 700 refugees, just like 700 from all these like that are flowing, you know. And um, and it created like an incredible kind of wave of racism and, and political crisis. So... We were like, how do we speak about that with the Latvian audience? And um, and that's why for us, that was this one reason why it was very important to speak about diaspora and say like, well, listen, but, you know, like not that far ago, so many people were sort of accepted in many different places, like Latvian people. So we should also think about migration today, that it, later it will create like a shared history. Uh, uh, yeah, So and, and that shared present should be maybe more different than, uh, you know, like surrounded by hostility. So, yeah, and, and the picture basically shows this one Latvian artist who lived in US and uh, her name is Diana Dagny. And it's interesting that in her work, she worked, uh, she made these three paintings, like the ones with refugees and the one with this woman in the 70s while living in America. And uh, you could kind of see these two things, you know, like one is really... Uh, she reflects on the refu the Vietnam refugees because she's like a perceptive, you know, like she sees what's happening in the world and, and in U.S. at the time. And the other one is uh, her family sort of arriving in U.S. So she already did that in the 70s, this kind of reflective work. And that uh, woman, it's more like about the role of uh, w women in America, you know, and in, the, in relation to consumer culture and all these things. So that's one of those, let's say, historical works. And um, so if I um, uh, still have time, I would like to just uh, read the quote <laughs> that was very inspiring for the, for the project. And so basically, um, it's from the catalog that we did. Um, so basically, migration resulting from uh, climate change uh, in, is particularly topical. Uh, nowadays and and it, there will be more and more of that yeah if not from wars then you know from the climate change because many territories will be completely underwater and uh, or become uninhabitable because of the higher temperatures so raising numbers of unregistered people may also pose a serious threat to democracy and cu currently existing structures of political representation and so the philosopher Thomas Nail offers an interesting way of looking at the situation. Uh, he suggests reviewing both history and the current political situation from the point of view of movement, migration, and the migrant instead of that of a static citizen. So Nail uh, calls his theory kinopolitics, uh, and it's a reference to social kinetics or movement. And so rather than uh, taking the preconceived notion of the citizen, as his point of departure, he uh, proposes beginning with migration flows, looking at the ways in which migrants travel to become citizens and to form countries, and paying attention to how they often present an opposing force and an alternative to existing state structures. From a political point of view, a migration theory that takes movement as its prime consideration might be more inclusive than the one which prioritizes the citizenship. And uh, yeah, so in a way, while it seems 
like a riddle or or like a weird utopia that we could look at the world like this i think it's a yeah it's a great way to finish the presentation thank you <laughs>